Okay, now, my name is Abraham Meth, M-E-T-H, and I was born in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, now, Hungary had a Jewish population of about one million, and unfortunately no more than about 600,000 are lucky ones who are left alive. I went to school in Budapest, and I went to the Jewish Theological Seminary, where I graduated in the Teacher's Institute, and I became a teacher. However, in Hungary, Jewish teachers couldn't teach in public schools. So each community had, each, Jew, each city or, or, or village had their own community school, Jewish community school, and they were once who hired Jewish teachers. Now, interesting enough, to represent, to give you a, a feeling about the situation in Hungary with regard to Jews. In Hungary, never knew me as Abraham met. I never used the word Abraham, because Abraham sounded too Jewish, and we tried to hide or to not, not uh, demonstrate our Jewishness. My name was Eugene. I just adapted it. And I went to public school under the name of Eugene. And interesting, uh, when I, before my graduation from the seminary, the uh, dean of the school told me, Mr. Matt, would you please bring in your uh, birth certificate so we can make out a diploma for you. So next day, I brought my certificate and Abraham met. He called me and I said, Mr. Matt, I asked for your birth certificate. He says, sir, I left it there yesterday, but that's Abraham and not Eugene. And I disclosed him the whole story that I assumed Eugene because I didn't want to publicize my Jewishness. And he had to change all my report cards from the first grade on from Eugene to Abraham. <clears throat> now, um, uh, we lived in Budapest, and the situation in Hungary for Jews was not very pleasant, not very friendly. <clears throat> Interesting enough that as a teacher we learned in school that the Hungarians came, arrived to where Hungary is today from the Ural Mountains area in Russia in the year 1000, and the first king was King Stephen. Yet the Jews were there three, four hundred years before the Hungarians, namely when the, the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in the year 770, Jews were scattered all over northern Africa, <coughs> in, in Middle East, and in Europe. And in Europe, the Jewish peddlers Jewish merchants followed the Roman army wherever they went north. So the North Roman army went up to, I think, to about Vienna. And the Jewish peddlers went with them and they settled down in Hungary. So there were Hung Jews living in Hungary five, six hundred years before the Hungarians came in. And yet they were considered as intruders not belonging there. Uh, they are the Hungarians were anti-Semitic long before the appearance of Hitler. <clears throat> Namely, uh, the Jewish, the uh, Russian uh, Communist Revolution took place in 1917. Following the Hungarian Revolution in 1919 was also a com Communist Revolution. However, it was defeated in six months. Unfortunately, the leader of that revolution was a Jew named Bela Kuhn, or Kohn. Of course, he was as much Jewish as I'm an astronaut. He was born a Jewish, but didn't believe in it. He was a communist, believing his communism will bring more freedom. And so, since it was defeated after the uh, so-called white terror, the Hungarians considered every Jew as a communist, regardless whether they knew 
bail account or they were active, definitely they were not active, but the association between bail account being a Jew and all the Jewish people remained. And from there on, Jewish um, situation wasn't life-threatening, but was very, very difficult. Jews uh, were not employed in any government position, any city position. Um, they couldn't be a policeman, couldn't be streetcar drivers. The only, only area where they could make a living was small business, merchants. And so all the small merchants were mostly Jewish. And so it happened that when a Jewish high holiday came, all those merchants closed down because of the high holidays. And Budapest looked on the holiday of Yom Kippur like a Sunday afternoon. And they didn't like that either. Now, 1933, <clears throat> I was married in 1939. The year Hitler, the war began. And of course, everybody thought, I'm out of my mind. The Jewish situation was so perilous there, and there I am, a young man, want to get married. In fact, they were right. Uh, we had our, our wedding with my wife, Lily, uh, at a synagogue. And as you know, Budapest has two parts, Buddha and Pest, and the Danube River flows in between. And on the Buddha side is mountainous, hills, hilly, and there were a lot of nice hotels there. And, and so we decided that we spent two or three days after our wedding with my wife in one of the hotels. <clears throat> and there was a clock train moving up on that mountain. And at night after the wedding, we entered the clock train. And unfortunately, there were four young punks, each of them with the band of the arrow cross on the arm. They could have sat anywhere in, the, in that big uh, coach. No, they were sitting right in front of us, facing us. And the trip lasted for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And all through the train trip, they, they, they uh, entertained us with comments like this. Well, stupid Jews, they don't know what's going to happen to them. And they really getting married now. And they, they, they don't know what's going on. And so and they began to threaten us. And, but unfortunately, they didn't do any harm, only talking and scared us to death. I was holding my wife's hand. She was holding my hand. And we didn't know what's going to happen. They could have killed us any time. Finally, we reached the top of the mountain. And the, uh, we got out. And fortunately, there was a policeman standing at the... Uh, at the station there. Not that we had expected too much help from, from him. However, the fact that he was a policeman gave us a little bit of a security. He walked into the hotel and went to bed and had a good night's sleep because we were so exhausted from that event. Now, <clears throat> well, the situation began, the, the anti-Jewish situation began in 19... 35, 36, when each month a, another uh, uh, edict came out um, re reducing the freedom of Jewish people. Jewish people couldn't own any means of communication, not even a bicycle. <coughs> uh, Jewish people uh, couldn't own a radio. Jewish people, uh, when, they, when they were a businessman, they all had to hire a non-Jew as a partner. Although the non-Jew had no part in the management of the business, but he had to have half of the profit given to him. And so on every month, something more and more strict, until finally the war broke out, and Hungary was an ally of Germany, and Hungary actively participated in a war on the side of Germany. Now, the, the German army, wherever they occupied a country, the, the first task of them was to collect, to find every Jew and ship them to all the concentration camps. But as you know the story, they all uh, were killed, first worked hard and then killed, and, and they were um, uh, 
he burned in the, in the crematorium. The Jews in Hungary were fortunate because Hungary was not occupied by the Germans yet, like Poland and, and, and the Baltic states and, and Russia and so on. Our problems began in uh, 1943, when the, the uh, Russians moved ahead, pushing the Germans back, and so they arrived close to Hungary too. That's when one our problems began. The Germans knowing that if the Russians will be there, the Jews will be saved. So they managed to, to, uh, to concentrate all the Jews, most of the Jews, first from the countryside, and there were one million Jews, and about, uh, say, 600,000 were in six months transported to Auschwitz, killed and burned. Now, we were in Budapest. Budapest was the last place where Jews could live. Of course, uh, <coughs> can, I, can I stop you for a minute? Sure. <coughs> You're on. In 1943, the concentration of the Jews in Budapest, which numbered 250,000, began. Uh, first of all, the Jews had to give up all their businesses, and they were concentrated into uh, houses which had a yellow star on it. Every Jew had to wear a yellow star. The doors were locked in the big apartment building. That included you and your wife. That's right. My wife and myself, too. Now, the Jews couldn't leave the building only between 1 and 3 to do some little shopping. But, of course, by that time, that there was so little thing to, to be had gotten that, that, that only the last ones could find some food. And uh, then in, in an apartment building, a Jew couldn't own, one family couldn't own more than one room. If there was a four or five room apartment, there had to be four or five families living in. Imagine children and using one kitchen, five families, one kitchen, very little food, maybe some potato, maybe some kind of a vegetable, something that, no meat, butter, anything like that. But I was among the luckiest, we were the luckiest. I don't know if you've ever heard the name of Raoul Wallenberg. Yes. Raoul Wallenberg was a wonderful man, a, a Swedish man, who was a real, real, real humanitarian. And he was sent by the Swedish government to Hungary. Here is a story. The, uh, the German army was uh, felt that they had been, been defeated and needed trucks very desperately. Sweden had a big steel industry, and, and Sweden did not participate in the war. And the German government uh, made a pact with the Swedish government that the Swedish government would supply them with 6,000 trucks in exchange for 6,000 Jews. Now, but since the Jews could not be transported during the war over the front, you know, they had to have, uh, Wallenberg bought apartment buildings where they put out the Swedish Red Cross, and that apartment building enjoyed the Swiss, Swiss, uh, the uh, Swedish territory, ex-territorial rights. Nobody could enter without any permission there. And, uh, Jews were collected, whoever managed to get in there, got into this and felt safe. We managed to get into that building at the end of 1944, October. Now that house was the, happened to be the office building of a glass factory. And Jews and people were living in the basement, they were in the basement on, on floor, on, on uh, what you call bunks, and, and, and next to one, like sardines, next to one another. Men couldn't even lay down, only children and women could lay down there. And we were there for four months. From, from November to February till we were liberated. Now, they... Um, you were liberated by what? We were liberated by the Russian army. Yeah. Now, but for four months, 
The Russians bombed Budapest every morning at 5 o'clock. And we didn't know whether a bomb would fall on that building or not. Fortunately, it didn't fall. But my apartment building, Budapest, was totally burned down. So finally, it lasted. And, and the, imagine, there was only two toilets in that whole uh, front yard. And we must have been about eight, 900 people in that one building. We had to stand in line in the morning. And it was January and February. So uh, finally, uh, to make the short story short, one morning there was no more bombing. And we were very much afraid. We didn't know. Did the Russians throw the Germans out? Or did the Germans throw the Russians out of the city? And we were in that silence, waiting what's going to happen. Suddenly, the huge door down leading down to the basement opened up, and the Russian sto soldiers stood with a Kalishnikov with the uh, machine gun, shouting then in Yiddish language, Jews, you are saved. And, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm also very emotional now. Anyway, and we, we came out and, and uh, tried to vent out on the street. There were hundreds and hundreds of dead, stiff, frozen bodies lying around because the Nazis, the Hungarian Nazis, then went searching for Jews because there were a lot of Jews who tried to manage escape by forging Christian papers proving that they are Christians. And the, the Nazis went after them. And anybody whom they found had a false paper was shot right there in the street. You know. There were hundreds and hundreds of, of dead frozen bodies lying around there. But finally, we, uh, we escaped. Now, I must mention, many times I would ask the question, how come that the Jews let themselves be killed without any kind of, of resistance? Did they do anything for them? Well, and the, the general feeling was is that Jews didn't do anything. It's not true. There were Jewish a, a boys, young men, who were dressed in Nazi uniform and, and formed a patrol, and they were pro patrolling the streets. And it was the general practice of the, of, the gent, of the Nazis. Whenever they found Jews on the false paper, they took them to the Danube River, machine gun them down and the, and the bodies flow down with, in the river. So uh, the, the, these Jewish boys, the, the, the partisans, for patrolling the street, whenever they saw a group of Jews being taken, they asked them, uh, where are you taking these people? And they said, went to, to the Daniel, to the wonderful job, give them to us, we will take care of them, you keep us searching. And they too served. And there were a lot of instances where Jewish young people put their life in danger and harm to save some other Jews. So we, we were saved now. Now, this probably from here on, that's a brief story in our being in Hungary. And I'll tell you how we came to America and what happened in America. My name is Abraham Matt. I was born in Budapest, Hungary. I was raised there, went to school there and lived the, 30, the first 36 years life of my in Budapest. What year was it? I was born in 1912, and I'm now 97 years old. Uh, my, I, I, I attended the um, uh, Orthodox State School in Budapest, Hungary, and the high school and public school. And since in Hungary, Jewish men were not allowed on a very restricted number to attend the universities. The only place I could uh, continue my education was the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I entered the Teachers Institute of that seminary. I became a teacher at the age of 22. But uh, since uh, Jewish teachers were not employed by any government schools or city schools. Each Jewish community had its own school. And I, I was 
elected there to be a teacher in northeastern Hungary in the year 1937 to an Orthodox, uh, public, Orthodox day school. I stayed there one year, and it was an Orthodox school, although I was not an Orthodox. I was an, an observing Jew, but not an Orthodox. And summertime after the year, I went home to my family, to my parents, and did I was... Have, did you, excuse me, did you have brothers or sisters? Huh? Brothers or sisters, your family? Yes. I, I had two sisters and two brothers. We had five children, and I was the oldest one. Uh, I, was, I spent the summertime in Budapest waiting for the uh, uh, contract to be renewed, but to my greatest surprise, I got a letter that telling me, Mr. Met, the board decided not to renew your contract. Evidently because I was not orthodox enough for them. However, as much as I felt depressed and, and d disappointed, I'm glad I didn't stay there because next year that northeastern city, which was close to the Czechoslovakian border was the first a city to, de, to be evacuated by the Jews, and all the Jews were taken to Auschwitz. Had I remained a, a teacher there, I probably wouldn't be here today. So I stayed in Budapest and began to tutor children, uh, those failing children. I had a bicycle and run from place to place and the uh, I, I could cover about six seven hours of teaching every day uh, <clears throat> listen you hold on can i stop stop sure i mean you know this is not good okay uh, in 1939 i met my wife at the pulling ball and pardon me, I'm sorry, not 1939, in 1935. And we were dating for four years. And finally, in 1945, my father asked me, so how long will you keep that girl dating? Why don't you get married? Of course, everybody thought that I'm crazy to get married in 1939 because the war broke out in 1939. However, I decided that whatever it will be, will be. In February 24, we married. Uh, the, in Hungary, it was always a very anti-Semitic country for two reasons. First of all, they considered the Jews as intruders who should be there, although Jews lived in Hungary centuries before the, the Magyars, the Hungarians came there. Because according to the teaching what we had to teach the children in school. The Hungarians came there in the year 1000 from the Asiatic uh, all uh, um, mountains. And the Jews were there centuries before because they were following the Roman Empire as merchants. And uh, wherever the, Rome, the Roman soldiers went, the Jewish merchants followed them and helped them, provided them with the Necessities. So the Jews came there in Hungary in the year four, five hundred already uh, AC, 200, 400 years before the Hungarians came there. Well, now the war years were very difficult because uh, m myself and my wife <coughs> were taken to different labor camps. Fortunately, we were not shipped outside of the country. Had we been shipped outside of the country, I wouldn't be here today, and neither my wife. But we stayed within the borders. I did all kinds of work. I worked in a textile factory. Then I was taken to a forest to cut out uh, the roots of trees that were cut down. <coughs> <coughs> then I carried 50 pounds sacks of flour from Danube River to, uh, to the military installation. But the situation was very difficult because the Hungarians came out every two, three months with new uh, laws, new edicts, uh, uh, yeah, limiting the 
the moving possibilities of Jews. For instance, uh, Jews couldn't have a radio because they were afraid that we were listening to Radio Europe and all the British BBC and get the world news what really happened. Jews couldn't use any means of communication, not even a bicycle. Uh, Jews couldn't own a business. Each Jewish business owner had to have a, a Christian a partner who received a check, 50% of the income, despite the fact that he never spent an hour in the business, but he had to give him a check. And, and many, many more. Jews could not own could not live in a complete apartment. They, they had to occupy only one uh, room. And in every room, there had to be another Jewish family. So it was very, very crowded. And finally, uh, I, several times, I, we escaped. And we were then uh, captured and put back until in, in 1944, I met a gentleman by the name of Raoul Wallenberg. He was a Swedish diplomat who was sent by the Swedish government to negotiate with the Germans. Namely, the German army needed uh, trucks at the end of the war. And uh, the Swedish government made a pact with the uh, German army, that they would sell them 6,000 trucks in return for the life of 6,000 6, Jews who were to be shipped after the war to Sweden. Now, Raoul Wallenberg bought a big apartment building and placed a few hundred Jews there first. But as the rumors, rum, uh, and the news came out about his salvation, more and more young men escaped the labor camps and, and tried to get into our building. Then the building was full and Ralph Wallenberg, which we considered as the German Schindler, bought another apartment. And, and a few, few weeks later, that apartment was filled. And so in six months, he bought six apartment buildings, and about uh, four or five thousand Jews were living in there. We were in one of them. Let's see. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and in in some people ask me the the question, how come that Jewish people were so willing or willingly go to the death camps? Why didn't they re uh, rebel? Why don't you? Why didn't you do something? Well, it, it is true. They did. There were a lot of Jewish boys in the underground, and I can tell you a few stories. There was one Jewish group consisting of about 30, 35 people, who managed to get some Nazi uniforms, and they were patrolling the streets. And when they have seen a, a Jewish group had, had uh, led to the Danube River for, to be shut down, they told the, the, uh, the Germans that give them to us, we will take care of it, and you go on and continue fighting, c continue searching more. Now, uh, the, the Germans were searching for Jewish people who managed to, uh, to uh, get hold of uh, Christian papers, proving that they were born Christians and, uh, and didn't have to wear the yellow star and were moving freely in the open world. But uh, the Germans discovered it and went from house to house searching and asked the people to identify themselves. And, and they found some Jewish man who was hiding and the Christian papers, they took him all to the Danube River and shot them and then, then and the water carried them down. So, anyway, uh, we, uh, we were in, uh, in 1945, January, uh, 
the Russians surrounded Budapest. The Germans were withdrawing, and the Russians were after them, and Budapest was surrounded. And we were in that house, in the basement, somewhere around 1,000 Jewish people, in the dark, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we were wondering. The, the Russian bombers came every morning and bombed the city from 5 o'clock for 2 three hours. And we didn't know when the bombs would hit our building. Fortunately, it didn't. Uh, may I go back for a moment and tell you all about the, uh, the Jewish underground too. Besides those people who saved the, the groups that were led to the Danube River, we had other groups that provided us with food. There was another, another group of Jewish uh, underground uh, uh, people who, uh, who uh, when they saw a truckload or two truckloads with food moving uh, from the Danube River inside, they stopped them because those Jewish boys had the insignia of uh, hiring uh, Hungarian officers, stopped the truck and told the drivers, they uh, give the truck to us and you, and you go ahead and get some empty trucks to pick up more. And so they took, they brought those full trucks of flour or potatoes to our houses and we were fed potato, potato, bread every day. Now in 1945, in February, the uh, bombing of Budapest stopped. And we didn't know, well, did the uh, Russians threw the Germans out? And the Germans threw the Russians out. And suddenly, around 10 o'clock in the morning, the big, huge wooden doors of the basement flung open, and there stood a Russian soldier telling in, in Yiddish that, Jews, you are, you are saved. And of course, the, uh, the, the uh, emotions were, were undis descri indescribable. People began to cry and to, and to be happy. But when we went out on the street, it was a terrible scene. There were, it was in February. There were hundreds and hundreds of dead, naked bodies lying around on the streets and burned out uh, shops. And, and then we were asked by the Russians to uh, pick up those bodies and take them to a place where they were buried. We went back to our apartment building it was totally burned down, and we have no pictures, no, nothing to remind us of our life before the war. In 1939 February, we finally decided to get married. And of course, the marriage is not like in America, where we have a synagogue, and there's a social hall attached to it, there's a big dinner, Cater dinner, music, no. We had it outside in the courtyard because that was a tradition in Europe, the weddings in the courtyard. It was February, two inches of snow on the ground, and people were shivering, but there we had to have it. And then we decided to go for one or two days to a hotel on the top of the Buddha, which is a hilly area. And there was a cock train leading out up to the, to the uh, hotel. <clears throat> and when we arrived after the wedding ceremony, we arrived to the station to, to take the train. There were five or six young punks with a Nazi arrowhead band on their arm, and they came into the same train. Now there was only one compartment. We were sitting in the center, and they could have had a lot of rooms to sit in that compartment, but they selected to sit right facing us. And it was about a 25 minute ride. All through the 25 minutes, they were entertaining us with something like this. Well, Jewish people don't know what's gonna to happen to them. They're still getting married. They don't know how short their life marriage will be will last. And that kind of a conversation, and of course, it, it chilled our, our, our blood, and I was holding my wife's hand, and they could have killed us any time, and nobody would have known what happened. 
nobody was around. But finally, the train arrived on top of the hill, and fortunately, there was a soldier standing, a policeman standing there. Not that we uh, trusted this, the policeman, but he at least represented the so-called law. And so we, the, the five punks left and left us alone with the uh, policeman who guarded us to the hotel and spent a night there. And we were so exhausted spiritually that we went to bed and had a good night's sleep. Can I, can I back up a minute? And had a good night's sleep. We were so exhausted from the event of the half an hour. No. Yeah. I want to back up just a little. Could you tell me who attended the wedding? Well, the wedding, my, my wife uh, lost his, her parents a couple of years before, and she used to, be, I dated her for four years, and she used to come to our house like a member of the family. So we had my parents, my brothers and sisters, and, and, um, and her brother, just, in, just a family, and the wedding took place in the synagogue yard, and then we went up to my, my brother-in-law's apartment and had a, a cake and a few drinks, and that was all. Nothing like the American wedding, really. What about your extended extended? Now, I had a brother who, who was killed in a war. He, he was a fatalist. And, and he, he had the, 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 uh, the uh, decision, whatever will be, will be. I myself tried to always get some medical papers proving that I'm sick, that I have all kinds of problems, and I will not be good in, in a labor camp. So, but he said, no, I don't want to do anything. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So it happened that he was in Yugoslavia, and when the Germans were withdrawing back uh, around the Hungarian border, he, he got typhus, I understand from someone who was with him, and he died. We don't know where he was buried, in a bit anything. Uh, my, my parents survived together with us in the house with Raoul Wallenberg, and so my brother and my sister too. And so my father passed away uh, in 19... In, oh, yes, in 1948, we came to this country, my wife and my two children. And um, I was a teacher, graduating from a seminary, and uh, I came here as an interpreter because I spoke English very well already in Hungary. As a matter of fact, I was teaching English here too because almost every Jew wanted to learn English in the hope that we'll get to Canada, to America, to Australia, to any English-speaking territory. So I was busy teaching English then. And um, uh, when we, when we I, I, I was interpreter of a Hungarian uh, member of the, of the government who came here to study, uh, study some kind of a, uh, uh, communication. And I was asked to study American school system. And when I was here, I met a, a, a rabbi in a congregation who gave me a contract of uh, being a teacher, a building teacher in the school. And, and then at that way I could come above the quota because the Hungary, Hungarian quota was prescribed for the next 20 years. I couldn't have come in 20 years later. But they allowed teachers, engineers, and and uh, and clergy people above the quota. So I came here, and uh, I, after two months being in New York, I went up to the Jewish Theological Seminary. and is that, you, is that where you landed in New York? Yes, in New York. We landed in New York, yeah. And we went, it was in 1948, after three years living after the war in, in Hungary. And uh, I went up to the Jewish Theological Seminary office to make contact. There I met the wife of a rabbi who happened to uh, look, happened to be looking for someone as a sexton. And she asked me, would you like to come to Kansas City? I had no idea what Kansas City was, but I said, yes, I want to. So we came to Kansas City to a big congregation that had 1,500 families. 
as a section and teacher in the Hebrew school and also as a assistant cantor. And I lived there, we worked there for 31 years until I retired in 1978, coming to uh, Sun City. And I had 31 wonderful years, did a lot of work, I was very active, and I was dealing with children. I prepared over a thousand bar mitzvah boys. I participated at hundreds of weddings, and I, I was very happy. And uh, and but time has has come for me to retire. What I, else? I understand you're active in the choir here in Sun City. Yeah, my, when we came to Kansas, a little bit about your music. Yeah, well, wait, okay. As, as, a, as a teenager, I began to learn to play music, violin. And, uh, well, I, I have to come back. My father was a jeweler. And uh, he, was, he was really an artist in jewelry making. And he had a foresight and said, listen, son, <coughs> sit down and learn a trade. You never know when it will be handy for you. So he taught me, and in two years as an apprentice, I learned the trade, jewelry trade too. Then I learned to play violin. And there were times when I didn't have any students. So I, I uh, uh, organized a dance band and we were, we were playing at the dance halls. And then, uh, what else? Yes, and then there was summertime people didn't dance, but the, the stores were preparing for Christmas uh, sales. And I, I was good at calligraphy, and I was good at, at uh, painting. I paint, made uh, display windows and backgrounds to the uh, display windows. Is that Sun City? Yeah, no, that, that was, was, uh, that was uh, uh, all in Budapest. Oh, in Budapest. Uh, Budapest, not in Sun City. In Sun City, I came to the, to the congregation to teach, and, and I stayed there for two. That was all throwback from in Budapest. Yeah. How about you? I understand that you do or designed and made jewelry. Someone told that's me right. that. Yeah, that's right. When I came, yes, uh, in settling down in Kansas City, I put up a, a jewelry shop in my basement. And I was working in silver. And I did a lot of jewelry, uh, of, of Jewish uh, uh, icons, Mark and David, and Menorah, and so on. And... Uh, I sold uh, to some of the congregations, and I still have some samples left there. Yeah, I saw one. I would like to buy one, but uh, <laughs> I will when. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Later. Okay. On. So I, I was very busy. I, I, and then, coming to uh, San City, I joined the congregation Beth Shalom, and it was a young congregation that uh, was starting only. And most of the people were business people, <coughs> but had little idea about the spiritual substance of a congregation. So I brought all my 30 years experience to the congregation, started classes, started, started the um, education, adult education, and uh, started a choir, I became the choir director there, and also uh, I used to go out for 30 years. I've been going out to to Phoenix the congregation, who was looking for a re Torah reader that read the Torah on Saturdays, and I studied very hard, and I was accepted, and I'm still doing it there now. Beth Bethel. Bethel, Bethel yes, at Bethel, I'm still doing it now. At every Saturdays and every holidays, I'm there reading the Torah reading. And I was also there as the first 15 years choir director and teaching at the uh, Hebrew school. <laughs> so I, I, I spent a very, very busy life doing a lot of things. Tell me a little bit about your uh, rest of the family, your sisters. No, I, I have not, uh, my brother died in uh, a year ago in, in New York. He lived in New York. And uh, he was a, a businessman. But my sister uh, and my mother remained in Hungary after I left. As a matter of fact, the saddest part of my coming to 
America was that my father was was very very sick with, with cancer, and uh, I, I and I, I, I you see the Russians controlled Budapest for after the three years of four years of war, and nobody could leave the country without a Russian exit permit. And I got an exit permit that was supposed to expire one Sunday night. It happened to be the, uh, the funeral of my father. And unfortunately, I, I, we went out to the funeral, came back, and all I had time to say, uh, my he goodbye to my mother, we had to go right to the airport and to the rail railroad station get on the train and go from Budapest by train to Austria and to Paris, where in Le Havre we took a ship. And you, and you were with your uh, and wife and five, yes. children? Now my, my mother and my sister stayed in Budapest. But in 1956 there was a, uh, there was a revolution, a Hungarian revolution against the Russians, 1956. And then uh, for about 24 hours, the borders were open, and a lot of Hungarians escaped. One of them was my mother, who was at that time 71 years old. My sister and my brother-in-law, they all came to Budapest. They were desperately calling me, trying to get them an, a, 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 a visa to come to America. I couldn't, but the, the uh, Canadian government had someone there and who accepted every immigrant. And so they went to Canada, and my daughter, my, my sister is still living in Toronto, Canada. My mother passed away 10 years ago. <coughs> I don't know why I'm so hoarse. <coughs> You're doing great. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that should give you enough material. That's good. And what about right up to date you have for your wife and your two, two children? Two children. And where are they? I have, yes, sir. Yeah, I have two children. My son, who is now, who is now 65 years old, and he's retired from a uh, big business where he was the uh, uh, CEO, uh, taking charge of financial matters. And then I have a daughter who lives here in in Phoenix, who's a nurse practitioner, and she's 61 years old. And she's one of the very ten nurse practitioners who are licensed for writing uh, prescriptions and doing medical work like the doctors. And my son has two sons, and one of them is married, having a, two children. So I have two great grandchildren, and my daughter has two two sons too. Both of them adapted one from one from South America and the other one from Russia. And so that's my family life. Oh, okay. So I have a lot of material to write. <laughs> so that brings us up right up to date. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Now, and, and the second reason why the Hungarians were anti-Semitic long, long before Hitler came to the, to the scene, that the Russian uh, Communist Revolution took place in 1917 and they overturned the Tsar. Two years later, 1919, there was a Hungarian communist revolution, and unfortunately, the uh, leader of, it, of that uh, revolution was a Jew named Bela Kong, who was as much of a Jew as I'm a, an astronaut. He completely uh, negated, he was completely assimilated, and he was a communist and not a Jew. He was born a Jew, and from and that communist state lasted only for six months. And after six months, it was defeated, and there was a so-called white terror, the right-wing terror took over in Hungary, and they identified every Jew with Bela Kohn. They thought that every Jew is a closet communist, because the leader of the communist revolution was a Jew. They thought every Jew was was for him. And so that, that since 1919, 
uh, there are all kinds of anti-Jewish laws appear. And Jews could not attend the university, only 5% of Jews, and even that they have to bribe all the people there. Uh, Jews were not hired by any city government organization. Jews could not be a policeman, could not be a street car driver, not even even street car cleaner. The only, only area where they could make a living was small business. And so every Jew was a small businessman. And which later on, they had to share it with a, uh, with a Gentile, as I've told before. So, and, 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 and I said that most Jewish kids didn't go to public school. They went to the school maintained by the Jewish congregation, Jewish community in the... In Is that the, the school, kind of school you went to? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Did you notice early on, in your early years in school, what? did you notice uh, anti-Semitism when you, in the beginning? Yeah, well, I tell you... In your early in, years in school. In, in a way, I never had any Gentile friends. I never knew anybody, any Gentile, because I was moved in Jewish circles. And uh, there were not too many Gentiles who wanted to associate, affiliate with Jewish people. So we lived in an isolated world, really all by ourselves, for ourselves. Not like here in America, you have friends. I have here a lot of Gentile friends in this building. Not in America, not in Hungary. Yeah. Is your family religious? And, and uh, did you belong to uh, any synagogue? Oh, yes. Not there, we didn't belong. You don't have to belong. The community maintained the synagogue, and it was free for everybody to uh, go there. Yes. and. My father was very musical, and when he had to work on Saturdays, he did work. But but uh, managed to with me to walk from synagogue to synagogue and to listen to the cantors. They were beautiful cantors singing, and there were three synagogues very close distance, and we went for one to the other one just to listen to the cantors' music. Have you observed? Yes, we had. Passover meals, Saturdays. Uh, he he worked when he had to, but he rather not to. What was his occupation? He was a jeweler. Oh, oh he, he he was jewelry jewelry maker. He made jewels out of gold, silver, platinum. Now let me tell you then. We had in Budapest. We had a, a two bedroom apartment. There were two small bedrooms connected by a little hall and a kitchen. And in one of the rooms, my father had his bench where he worked, and that was their bedroom. And in the other bedroom, five children slept in two beds. And that upper room was also a living room, dining room, and, 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 and what else? And, 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 and living room, dining room, and bedroom. And there was a kitchen. So you can imagine, I studied, played the violin, and how I practiced with my four siblings in the rooms, and my father working, and I had to practice there. And, and that was a norm. We didn't feel we are very poor, because that was a norm of middle class people lived there. Was your mother a full-time mother? Wow. Yes, she, women didn't work there in Hungary. And not not, a, not Jew, Jewish women. They all were mothers and housewives. Yeah, and and don't forget that in those days, uh, Jewish people were not very educated. The first generation, because the first generation, if they went for public school, that was oh, you could read and write. That's all. So there was no high school for for uh, my mother's age there. Now the children already went because we had already schools in Budapest, high schools. But they didn't go. My father came from Romania. My mother came from Poland. Where in Poland? Poland, uh, I don't remember the city. Galicia. Yeah. And so they, they met in Budapest and then married. But, but they had very, very little education. Because people, of, uh, Jewish people especially, of that generation, didn't go to school. Folk, folk elementary school was all. What about your wife's family, extended family? 
my, 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 my wife lost her father at the, when she was eight years old, and uh, and her mother passed away in before we got married. Well, before we got married, she had a brother, and she has one sister. The brother died about ten years ago, and she still has one sister living in, in Kansas City. Yeah. In your father's family, extended family. My father's family. Yeah. Well, uh, he had about uh, 10, 11 siblings scattered all over the world, South America, and Europe, and Norway. And he, he went after them, and he got stuck in Budapest. <coughs> but we, I don't know any of them. I never knew any of them. You didn't know your grandfather? Your I, I, I was about five, six years old when I visited once with my mother in Romania. But I have very little memory of him. I was wondering where he picked up the mu where he picked up the uh, musical background and the uh, you know making jewelry. That's uh, the jewelry I learned from my father. I know. But yeah. Where did your father pick it up? <laughs> oh, he was an apprentice there. He came as a 16-year-old boy, okay. and he was an apprentice there, and learned it, and he went on his own. Had a little bench in the apartment with, with gas lights, with gas uh, to to to. Sadder things, you know, I mean. yeah. and then uh, he made me to sit down, and that. So you learned a little bit of, from from, your, from him, yeah. and I did the same thing in brass and copper, pendants and earrings and, and rings. Of, um, do you do any of that? Yes. Now? Yeah. Do, you, you do? No, I I, I stopped doing that. Yeah, but for, in Kansas City, I did it for thirty years. <coughs>